This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for KX with Ken. And today, Ken is surprising, at least me, I don't know if he's going to surprise you, the audience, but he's surprising me because he's going to talk about uh, an individual uh, who he's actually going to write a book about. We're going to talk about the CIA. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) New scoop. <laughs> New scoop. Okay. So I was with Amy Ferris last week. We, they were, she and Ken were at the house. We were sitting around and talking. And uh, we have a mutual friend that I grew up with. I knew him from when I was four years old. And I told them this whole story about him and meeting him all my life, et cetera, et cetera, and then what came out of this. And Amy being the writer and the provoker that she is, she says, Ken, you got to write this book. This is a great book. You got to write this book. Yeah, Amy, you always got me writing stuff. But (laughs) so (laughs) I thought about it and I said, I think it really is a very unusual and interesting story. And I have to tell it. And uh, the the decision was how to tell it because there are there's information in this story that uh, you just say shouldn't be for common knowledge. So it is, it's going to be written in the style of a fictionalized memoir where mm-hmm. I am going to be making up a story of a, a memoir with this character in the story. Okay. So therefore, he's protected, I'm protected, it's, it's fiction. Um, you decide for yourself whether it's true or not. <laughs> so, Got it. That's the background. All right. So, so let me tell you about this, uh, this book I'm writing. Uh, the character's name, is, the, the book is called Healer. Healer. It's about a character named Joe Legrand. Now, Joe Legrand was one year older than me, and he lived one block away from me. And we started playing before we went to school. And what we played was the Lone Ranger in Tonto. He always had to be the Lone Ranger. Of course. <laughs> he would never switch. And I, no matter what I tried to do to get him to switch, I, I got his mother involved, I got my mother involved, and nothing, nothing worked. And his explanation was simple. I'm a year older, you're a kid. Older kids always make the decisions. We play by my rules. And that's who he was. All his life, it was always by his rules. So we start out playing with the Lone Ranger. And, you know, he would, uh, we would go out looking for feathers for Tonto. And then we, you know, we'd get fake guns and stuff like that. We'd always pick villains and, and then good guys. And we, we were very creative, and, but we, we played this game forever. And all through uh, grammar school, uh, I would be uh, waiting for him on the corner. He lived one block further away from grammar school than me. And, and he would come to the corner. I'd wait for him and we'd walk to school together. You know, but in, in the perils of growing up and uh, grammar school, at some point he started to have older friends. And he would walk and now he would walk by and not even recognize his oldest friend because he was now with a group of his older friends. And I was still the young, I was always the younger kid. I I could never get rid of this label. So we used to play in his house. Now he had a house. It was a three story house. It had a living room, dining room, kitchen, a pantry, backyard, upstairs, four bedrooms, an attic, a basement. I mean, this place was a monster. I, I lived in a five-room apartment with four people. You know, I mean, yeah, we, we had a kitchen, three bedrooms, and a living room. And my mother changed the dining room into a bedroom. You know, we, we didn't have a lot of money, and, and, it, and it was tight quarters. So having him come over, and he's just, I, I brought him up to the house one time and, and he, in his style, he said, where the hell are we going to play? There's no room here. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So we used to always go to his house and play in, in there. And in the back, he had the yard. And so we started out with the football, like most young kids. And we would throw the football back and forth to one another. And then it eventually led to making up rules and playing touch football. And, you know, and then a few other kids joined and then we'd have like three on three. And then when we were older, maybe nine years old or so, we, we started playing tackle. And, you know, with football, you, the guy with the ball always needs blockers. And so was a Joey would always had to be the guy with the ball. And, you know, in football, you're running for a touchdown. You try to avoid the opposition, you know, right. you, you run away from them or you fake them out or you go around them or you, you just, you know, whatever. He would do this bonsai yell <laughs> and he would run right for you and knock you down. And he almost knocked me out. His knees came up, caught me under the chin, knocked me back. He kept running all the way till he scored the touchdown before he would turn around to look to see what happened. The other kids are trying to pick me up and everything. He walked by and he says, it's football, get used to it. So a little bit of a mean streak, a little bit of aggression, you know. It was a funny story when, when on, we went to um, kindergarten and I was in kindergarten, he was in first grade and I was in school like five days. And his third grader he kept picking on me. He kept coming up to me, calling me mud puddle. And in front of everybody else, embarrassing me, taunting me, picking on me, blah, blah, blah. And I, I didn't, barely knew the kid. And uh, I don't know, just this burst came inside me. And I, I jumped up in the air and clocked him in the nose. The kid was wearing glasses, broke his glasses, cut his nose. Fifth day of kindergarten, I'm in the principal's office. They're calling my mother. I get suspended. I have to go home. I have to come in the next day with my mother and father and tell the story of, you know, what happened. And then the principal found out that it was a third grader that was terrorizing me. And the, and the principal said to my father and my mother, that's terrible. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm in trouble. He said, no third grader should be picking on a kindergarten. He got what's coming to him but don't do it again. This kid had glasses on. You could really, you know, I barely even knew the kid had glasses. Never even thought about it. Tell a story to Joey. Joey thinks it's the greatest story in the world. Now, every time he sees me at lunch, he's coming up to me, putting his arm around me like I'm his buddy now. And I'm walking around and he said, this is the guy that beat up uh, that file. You know, the third grader, this is Ludwig. He beat the kid up. So, you know, he's, he's he got his taste for violence. Go maybe another year later, this other part of him comes in. He's Catholic. And it's strange because his mother looked a little bit like a dark Italian. She had olive skin, but she had tight black curly hair. Joey was a little bit darker than me, but you, he would get away with, you would say he was Sicilian or Italian or whatever, but he wasn't. His father was, uh, grandfather was French. The story is, is that his mother was an Algerian Jew who was living in a Muslim country, wow. hiding the fact that she was a Jew. Right. And now... Matt runs across this French Catholic who brings her to France and now she's hiding that she's Algerian and she's hiding that she's Jewish. Oh my. And so they come to New York and they raise him Catholic. The weird part was the connection with my father who was an Orthodox Jew who was hiding the fact that he was Jewish so that he could get work and, and marries my Protestant mother and so he, had, he and I both find out that we have secret Jewish <laughs> <laughs> And it explained his coloring and explained all, all, all interesting things. So getting to the Catholic part, he's like maybe 10, I'm nine. And he says, 
walk me to church. All right, where's church? Well, it's about 10 blocks away. It's this big Catholic church, huge, monstrous thing, scary place. Got big iron fence all around it. I never know why they ever fenced off churches. I thought it was because they that's where they stored the babies in the basement. <laughs> and where, you know, I was scared of nuns. Every yeah. day, outfits scared the hell out of me. And so I'm walking him to this church and he opens up the big gate and he goes and walks this long path and he walks into this scary building. And I'm standing outside going, what the hell is going on? And he comes out and he says, thanks for walking me. I said, well, what you doing there? He, I, I said, and anyway, why are we here? It's Saturday. Don't you go to church on Sunday? He says, no, you go to confession on Saturday. I said, what's that? He said, well, you go and you, and you, you, you tell your sins. I said, you're 10 years old. What, what kind of sins do you have? <laughs> he says, well, there's a priest in there and you tell him, you know, the, the bad things you said or the bad things you did or the bad things you thought. I said, wait a minute. I, I can understand you tell me a bad thing, you know, if you stole something or if you lied or you did something. Bad. But what is this uh, thought part? He said, well, if you have bad thoughts. I said, what's a bad thought? He said, you know, girls. You want to do stuff to girls. But what do you want to do to girls? You want to, want to touch them. That's bad? Yeah, that's bad. Oh, and, and what do you tell the priest? He says, I tell him I want to do it. Well, what does he say? He says, well, say five Hail Marys. <laughs> and well, he forgives you. I said, what do you mean he forgives you? He said, he blesses you and he forgives you. If, you. if you go to him in honesty and you say, I did bad things or I had bad thoughts, the church believes that that's a confession and he absolves you of all your sins. I said, but we're going every week. <laughs> well, I mean, you tell him the same guy, obviously last week, I did the same thing this week. And he's going to forgive you again. He said, yeah, well, that's the way it works. I said, so all you got to do is say a couple, couple of things like, what's a Hail Mary anyway? Uh, you know, Hail Mary, Villa Grace, blah, 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 blah. and he was done with it in two seconds. I said, and, and is that so bad? He said, well, you got to say five of them. I said, but, but now you're good to go? He said, yeah, I'm good to go. I'll see you next week. You know, and it was, I said, this, this is a crazy religion. I said, I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. He said, that's all a game. Okay. He went on to study Jesuits. He went on to, to have all kinds of religious ideology. And he was a deep thinker, incredibly bright, sensitive guy in terms of the meanings of things, et cetera, et cetera. So we're now, we're now getting to high school. And in high school, he's, he's like a normal guy. He's very bright, he's popular. He's in the senior play, he's on stage all the time, he's on council. But every time I go by the principal's office, he's in there. I mean, what are you doing in here? I, I said, well, you were in here last week. I keep getting into fights. What do you mean? He said, well, the, the, the high school's full of bullies. And uh, when I see him picking on somebody, um, you know, I beat him up. Took years for me to figure out what the hell he was doing with that one. He could get his violence. He could get into his fights and be the good guy. Because he was rescuing the victim who was being yeah. harassed by the bully. So I said, boy, you figured out a nice angle here. You know, you can come across as a good guy. So now it's like dating time, you know, we're in ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, you know. And he was like a little bit awkward and uncomfortable with girls. I, I never, I mean, I knew him his whole life. I always felt that he was a little retarded in his development about girls. He, he kind of had this secret 
early adolescent fixation about girls, you know, where you can't get them, but you want them. And then right. you want to control them when you got them and you want to do things to them and all this stuff. That's him to a T. So by 11th grade, he's got this dynamite redhead. She had the reddest hair in the whole high school and the biggest set you ever saw. And that's all he was focused on, the hair and the front. And she was dumb as a rock. <laughs> was nowhere near in the area code of his intelligence. You wonder what the hell he saw in her. And everybody knew what he saw in her. Right. You know, and it was embarrassing because, you know, he was puppy dogging her. He was following her around. And then she figured out she had power over him. And once she figured out she had power on him, she was meaner than he was. And then she would have this guy jumping through hoops. And, and everybody was looking at him and saying, what is wrong with him? I mean, he's a fairly good looking guy. He's smart. He's going to go to graduate school and like, whatever he turns, turns out to be. He's going to be good. He's going to be a successful guy. Everybody knew he was going to be a successful guy. What the hell is he doing with this? Well, he puppy dogged her all the way into second year of Columbia. When he graduated high school, and went to Columbia. He was still chasing after this girl. Till finally, after her fifth affair with somebody else, he finally got the message and quit. So, <laughs> couldn't figure this out. So now he's in, he goes to Columbia and at Columbia, there's ROTC, you know, right. it's Office of Candidates training. And his whole family history, they always, the men in there always did some kind of military service. And he looked up to that. I remember when he was a kid, he liked the Audie Murphy. We would have war cards. He would have guns. I mean, he was fascinated by guns and knives and all that stuff, and, you know. My father got shot up in the war. I'm, I'm not looking to do any service in the army. I'm not looking to do anything military. You know, we really were divergent when it came, when it, when it, when it came to that story. But so he's now going to, to Columbia and in his summers, he's going to paratrooper school. He's going to army ranger school. They smelled the blood in him. They picked him out. They start training him. Now he's going into special ops school. This is early 60s. The war in Vietnam is starting to build up. He's drooling. He wants to go. He works out a deal with the army that they're going to pay for his medical school. They're going to now send him to Columbia Med School. And after he comes out with his medical degree, they're going to use him. He'll, he'll, he'll have to give them three years. Right. He can't wait to go. So now he's a doctor. And now he's, he's in Vietnam. And he goes as a field doctor. He starts off going to mm -hmm. military posts, treating military uh, victims, you know, guys have been shot and stuff like that. Somewhere along the line, they figure out he would be a good double to go into the field, work as a friendly healer in Vietnam and help the villagers that are being assaulted by the, uh, uh, the VC. He'd work with the ARN, the South Vietnamese Army, going to these villages. They would establish himself, et cetera, et cetera. And he would do good, which, which you know, really worked. So he spent the first year, first year and a half, going from village to village to village, got a good reputation of somebody who knew his stuff because he was very bright. At some point... The CIA links up with the army and they want to interview him. 
So they interview him. They bring him into a room in Da Nang. And the guy in a suit uh, introduces himself and says, you know, who he is. And uh, they've noticed that Gio has uh, special skills. And they want to use him uh, as a ninja. That if there were double agents in the field that were working for the VC, it would be nice if they disappeared to help the cause, to help the military cause, the American war in Vietnam. He believed in it. He thought we were there for good reasons. He fell hook, line, and sinker that he was a good guy. And he, he would take care of people that needed taken care of for his government. You know, the army trained you to kill, and that's all he was doing. He was doing what the army told him to do. He had no conscience about it at all. So during the day, he's Dr. Healer, and then he would get an envelope, and there would be instructions. And at night, he would put on his black special ops outfit, sneak out into the night, and take care of some guy. Did that for maybe a year and a half, finished up his tour. Comes back, doesn't tell me any of this, just tells me, you know, I'm at Columbia too. So we're meeting for lunch and, and he's just telling stories about his healing ways. And now he's back and he's over die die and he, he wants to date and he wants to carry on. And he knows I'm living in the village. So he would come into the city and then we would go out. And now we're in our 20s in the village. It's the end of the 60s. It's crazy wild. He's, he's like um, <laughs> in a toy shop. You know, the amount of uh, hippie women that were in the city and in the village was, was like he, he couldn't get enough, you know. But to get date number two, only one night stands. That's, a, that's all he could handle. He's too busy becoming whoever he's becoming. Finally, he gets married, moves to the suburbs, opens up a practice. He's now a specialist. He's got a specialty profession. He's living in this ideal world. He's got a lot of money. He does his hunting. He does his fishing. He does his world travel. He and I are like telling our stories about traveling the world. And, and you know, I'm a therapist at this point. And so, you know, to me, he seemed like a very normal guy. He had gone through his, from what I understood was his, things with women, his things with the church. He had his issues with violence and everything, but now he's, he's pretty settled and it's about 2014. I get a phone call. Hey, Tonto. What? Meet me five o'clock. I said, where? East, west, or central? He said, east. Okay. So we had a code. When, when we meet in the city, east meant Peach Tavern on 18th Street and, 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 and Irving Place. It was a nice checkered tablecloth, Italian bar, good food in the back, air conditioned, outside in the summer at tables. We always met there. Or if we met on the west side, we met in the village at the White Horse Tavern, which was an old-fashioned Irish bar storytelling, a good long history. It was a great place to sit and reminisce, tell a story. And the other place was we'd meet in Washington Square Park and, and by NYU. And we'd go to uh, the Figaro, or we'd go to Googies, or we'd go to any of the really good uh, coffee houses. So this time he says, meet me five o'clock over at East. So I'm at, uh, I'm at Pete's Tavern. He comes in, I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. He walks in, he looks like Orson Welles. He says, look at me. I'm saying, oh my God, how fat this guy got. He said, I just lost 50 pounds. I'm down to a svelte 360. 
felt 360. The words just never kind of went together. Yeah. You know? He's huge. So he gives me this giant bear hug, you know, it almost cracks my rib, you know, like for him, it's all, all stuff. And he sits down and he's sweating and he's all pumped up. He's all energetic. I, I, I can't figure it out. So he, he's got his satchel. He says, look, he digs in the satchel and he pops out my book. Now my book had just been published. This was my Insanity at Home book. He's all, he says, I didn't know you wrote this book. It's fucking great. He said, I love this fucking book. It's all about our childhood and all the time. And the best part of it, he said, you put me in it. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was t- I told the story of, of Tonto in, in the first book. Right? Well, he's gushing. He's absolutely salivating over this story. And, and, and he's loving the book. He's, and I knew he read it because he's telling me all the pieces. I mean, he remembered this and he remembered that and everything. And he said, I didn't know you traveled so much. And blah. So we're having this really, really, really good time. And he reaches back in his satchel and he gives me a wrapped present. And I look at him like, you're giving me a present? So I unwrap the fucking thing, will you? I, I open up and it's the back, back of a frame of a picture. And he said, no, turn it around, numb nuts. <laughs> turn it, I turn it around and it's a picture of the Lone Ranger and Tonto. Oh, how nice. Full regalia on their horse. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, I'm getting, oh my God. I'm, I must actually mean something to this man. You know, I mean, here he is, he's memorializing our friendship. It's like 60 years almost now. And here it is, an old fashioned, you know, the, the one you always see of the two of them on the horse, Tonto's got the feather and the Lone Ranger's got the, got the thing on the white hat. It was, it was like, I'm just sitting there and, and, and he said, Jesus Christ, you, you know, get over it, you know? <laughs> So I'm, I'm really having a moment with him. And, and, and he said, I didn't think it was going to be this fucking hard just to give you a present. <laughs> so he says, I got one more. And he reaches back in his satchel and he comes up with another wrapped. This looks like a soft cover book. And it's wrapped. And as he goes to give it to me, I said, y- you do know I'm already spoken for. <laughs> 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 yeah, shut up, wise ass gives me the book I open it up and it's his book and it's called Deep Currents and I look at it and he said I wrote one too he said but this one's fiction he said well it's not all fiction he said based on parts of my life, but then it goes off the rails into fiction. Let me know what you think. Uh, We finish up, we're talking about our kids, we're talking about life, and it's good, et cetera, et cetera. And he said he's, he's in therapy. I said, you? Yeah. He said, it's actually good. He said, you know, I was a nasty prick most of my life. I was a horrible fucking guy. I mean, I hated women. I hated everybody. I was violent. I was mean. I was nasty. He said, you know, really, they should have locked me up long ago. He said, but this therapist is really helping me sort shit out. I said, oh, so he's behind all this good stuff. <laughs> He said, no, no, no. He just opened my eyes. This is me. You know, this is me. I, he doesn't know anything about these gifts or anything. And I'm not setting you up for anything. I'm just, I'm just appreciating you. You know, like you, you've been there for me my whole life, you know? So just read the fucking book. Okay. So we finish up, whatever. I go back. Now here's this book. And what's the book about? Well, it's a book about a guy who uh, went to paratrooper school, became a ranger, went to Columbia, was a doctor, and went to Vietnam. 
And I said, well, your imagination is a little bit uh, short, you know, I mean, if this, <laughs> if this is a fiction book, Joe, you know, uh, you know, it's everything that you. So I'm reading the book and as I'm reading it, it all starting to ring true is that he really is military. He, if you were in the army or you're in the Marines or you're in the service, there are words and things that you know that other people don't know because it's military nomenclature, like FDA. What the hell's FDA? Well, you ask anybody who was in the army, everybody knows what FDA meant. It meant fuck the army. And you used to see it all over the place. FDA scrawled on walls and everywhere, you know. But to a civilian, they never knew what, what FDA. And, you know, you don't know the difference between an M1 and M16. And you don't know what a field op is. And, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. And he's talking all this stuff in the book. Talking about you know, how he went out in Vietnam. And there was a woman, a Vietnamese woman, that used to come into the barracks and she cleaned the barracks. And everybody trusted her. And then after about six months, she left the grenade in the, in the barracks and blew the place up and killed five guys. So she now was somewhere in, in the village and his job was to go find her. And he did, and he found her. And he said, what he did is he took his knife and he went between her legs and picked her up off the ground like that and cut her all the way up to her neck. He just went like that. And he said it like, like it was nothing, like it didn't bother. He said, she was bad. She was bad. She had to go. And he talked about a turncoat general that he had to drag him out of his house in front of his family and took him outside and cut his head off. Did all kinds of stuff. Came back, you know, and now He's trying to fit into this regular life, being a doctor, living in the suburbs, coming to see his friends, et cetera, et cetera. And he gets a call. Who's he get a call from? The CIA. Guy gives him a room in Abercrombie and Fitch upstairs in the administrative offices, he gets a, a number on a door, like go up to the 12th floor and, and, and go into room 1206. And he goes up into the room into 1206. Door opens, a guy in a shirt and tie comes and says, I'm from the CIA. We know about what you did in Vietnam. And we'd like to use your skill set. He said, but you're a civilian now. And um, I want you to come to an office downtown next Tuesday, two in the afternoon, blah, blah, blah. There's another meeting. We'll discuss it then. Think about it. If you don't show up, we'll understand you said no. So he goes. Goes to the meeting. Another guy, and the guy says to him, he said, listen, we know your history, but we'd like you to take this test before we complete the deal. And he looks at him. I said, I'll give you 20 minutes for the test. Joe takes the piece of paper, he gets his thing, he writes, fuck you. On the paper, he hands it in, walks out. They called them up and they said, you're in. We need you. We're glad your spirit is still high. 
He said, well, what do I got to do? He said, well, you will have one man who will contact you. You won't know his name. You won't know how to contact him. But he will contact you. And he will give you instructions. And you will follow the instructions. We want you to be as vigilant as you can be. Any assignment that, we, that you do as an agent, we will never find the remains. Do you understand? Yeah. And he said, and uh, what do I get for this? He said, well, you get $20,000 in the Swiss bank account for every job you do for us. Okay. So now he goes back to his wife, his kids, his practice. And about four times a year, he would get a call. And the call would say, report to Norfolk, Virginia, to the Avis Rent-A-Car. Tell them your name. There will be a car for you take a look in the trunk. So he'd go, rent the car, open up the trunk. In the trunk was a suitcase, briefcase, with various weapons and a portfolio of who he had to do. He had a week to meet the guy. His specialty was boats, always near water. He would go to Florida where there were alligators, or he would go into the islands where there were piranhas, and he would go fishing or set up fishing expeditions where he would meet the target, befriend him in the bar, have dinner with him, et cetera, et cetera, go out in two separate boats. He would show up, garret the guy, whatever, dump them with the alligators, stuff like that, go back, finish his day fishing, come back to the lodge, have had made a dinner reservation for the two of them, and the guy would never show up, and he would say, where's my, have anybody say, yeah, I saw him this afternoon, he was out in the boat, and blah, blah, blah. He did this from when he got out of the military in his late 20s, for 20 something years. Wow. Where he was a paid assassin for the CIA for 20 some odd years. When he got to be about 50, he said, I can't do it anymore. And he quit. And then it started the night terrors night sweats, the post-traumatic stress disorder, the guilt, his Catholic stuff. Now, Vietnam wasn't Vietnam anymore. What he thought he was doing in Vietnam was perfectly fine and good. And now Vietnam took a different, we weren't such the good guys anymore. Right. And he started to question that I just was obeying orders. And I said, yeah, you sound like every fucking Nazi I ever heard of. I was just doing my job. And the guilt started to get to him. And he started to become um, avoidant of social situations, conversations. He didn't want to talk about the military. He was always so proud. His whole office was full of military regalia and trophies and stuff like that. So he started eating and he went from 175 pounds to 410 pounds. Wow. So when I met him in 2014 now, he was back, he had, he said, oh, forget it. I don't, I don't know any of this. I'm just reading his book. 
So after this, he's down 50 pounds and we meet the next time after Pete's and meet him in the village. And he says, what do you think of the book? I said, well, I, 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 uh, I had trouble sleeping. Now, all I know at this point is the military stuff. But now I looking at him and he says, uh, I'm, I've had sleep problems, you know. And uh, I had to leave Texas. My head was too, too much noise around there. He said, I'm living, uh, I got a spread on a creek, uh, isolated in East Tennessee in the mountains. And I said, uh, you probably have PSTD. Uh, I said, there's got to be more to this book. I said, why well, don't you leave it out? I didn't leave out anything. He said, well, it, it, there was, a, you know, a, a couple things. It starts to talk and before you know it. And I said, you know what, Joe? This ain't fiction. You did it in the army and you were an operative, you don't ever quit them. They have a way of finding you. Right. And I saw in his eyes that he knew I caught him. And he started stammering, he started, I said, you're showing a tell now. On top of this, you're showing a tell, you, you're showing a tell. I said, look, you're talking to me. I said, Joe, I'm a professional shrink. I know what you're doing. I know when you're lying. I know you my whole life. He said, I've been wanting to talk for 20 some odd years. And I can tell you, but I'll kill you if you tell anybody. And the way he said it, it was like, he meant it. Right. I said, well, you got to check me out now? He said, just tell me the fucking story. You're, you're a mess. Look at you. You're the size of a small whale, and you're going to fucking die. Because his guilt is killing you. And now I know why you're living in East Tennessee, by, uh, by the creek. I said, because the sound in your fucking head is so loud that you, you need the peace and quiet just to calm down the, the, the quiet that's in your head at night. He said, exactly. I can't take it anymore. And for that, he starts blubbering and telling me all these stories that I just related about the CIA. And he's talking about all the different places he'd been, the amount of people he'd killed, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm sitting there. I'm so numb, I, I, I can't even, this is the Lone Ranger. This is my childhood friend who's killed over 80 people as a civilian, not even counting what he did in the military. So after that, he would call me and you could hear a difference in his voice. He said, I don't know how it's happening. He said, but I'm starting to sleep again. He said, I'm going to church again. I said, well, you mean it this time? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'm, I'm actually confessing. He said, I'm blown the poor fucking priest's brains. <laughs> this guy must think I'm a psycho. I said, yeah, he wouldn't be far off. He's a pretty strong priest, though. He's, he's able to, you know, the guy, he just doesn't say do a couple Hail Marys. He said, uh, come back. You probably have more to tell. 
All right. And so he, he's been doing that and he's still in therapy and he's, he's okay. So he says, listen, why don't you come down to Tennessee? Why don't you come see where I live? He said, I got a beautiful spring. He said, we can go out hunting. I said, I don't go near guns. I don't want to fucking hunt. He said, you want to go fishing? I said, I ain't getting in the boat with you. <laughs> yeah, all right. We won't, we won't fish. We won't hunt. He said, but, you know, what about darts? You want to play darts or shoot pool or something? Let's do something. I said, well, you got to do something competitive. So it's about three or four years ago now. I get the tickets to fly to Tennessee to finally see him in his environment buy the tickets uh, like a week ahead and we're going to go down on a Friday uh, to see him. And the Monday before that, his wife calls, said he dropped dead. So I never got to go see where he lived. But now I got his story and he's dead. And in some way, he, he, he fantasized about having a film made about him that it would have some, of course, some gorgeous guy sure. would, you know, play him, you know, George Clooney character who's got a, you know, a mean streak. And they would tell his story. But uh, it's, it's left to me uh, to tell his story. And so I am... Uh, in chapter three now. Well, you know, as I listen to the story as you tell it, you know, we all take various paths in our life, okay? And we are um, convinced by people that we are around what is the right thing to do, what's the wrong thing to do, even though we may have those voices in our head telling us they're wrong, but if they are older or more, seem to be more informed, we seem to tend to let them lead us. And we're seeing a lot of that, especially right now, you know, being played out um, in our government. You know, follow me and you'll be okay and follow me and, you know, get rid of the bad people um, because it's the right thing to do. And, and 20 years from now, they'll be looking at it very differently. Yeah. So I think, you know, this story is going to be good because, um, number one, it's going to be interesting. If you look at it as a fictional story, it's going to be interesting. Um, if you look at it like I will when I read it, knowing that you actually knew this person, um, it's going to be very haunting at the same time. Um, but I'm sure he's not the only one who has gone through something like this. No, it's a whole, it's dead to this day. It still goes on. And there was never a written contract. There was never a signature. There was never anything traceable ever. The only thing that was traceable was the money deposited into a numbered Swiss bank account. So, I mean. So his wife had no concept of what was going on. Only after he went to therapy. Where he then started to tell. Because you can't. You know, she lived with the night Thomas. And she lived with, you know. The, and uh, he, he eventually told her. You know, he told her. He told her and then he told me. And I think that's sure the shrink must have heard it because he was protected there. So now I feel okay because I will guard his identity. That wasn't his sure. real name that I used. And I, I don't give any other identifying characteristics. So I think in the general world, it's... Uh, it's the book of fiction. I, I think it's a great idea. I and, mean, and who knows if it's true? 
<laughs> hey, you know, maybe everything he told you was fake. Who knows? You know, well, that's what he said. Yep, exactly. Well, yeah, I'm except, so except for the other parts of the story that weren't in the book. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad that you are writing this book and we will follow along with you as you get closer to publishing it. Um, and again, you know, if anybody uh, has some other stories that you think that Ken or Amy would even want to uh, pursue, um, Amy's really good at making suggestions what the rest of us do, isn't she? I love her. Yeah. She is wonderful. Um, she lights a fighter under us. And, uh, so next next week uh, we've got Joel. Yes, we have my brother, and I think it should be an interesting uh, conversation between the two of you talking about um, real world events. Um, yeah, well, he was talking. We were talking music before. You know, oh, we were, okay. Yeah, we were talking about the Saratoga Club and the music he's got going on there and stuff like that. And but we're gonna get more into. Um, whatever the transpires between now and then. Well, I find my brother to be a very interesting soul. There's so many things about him that yeah. I didn't even know until I started interviewing a lot of his colleagues. And it was like, oh, that's my brother. Thanks for telling me. So again- so you wanna do it at, uh, at one or do you wanna yep. do- it uh, Next week, we'll be back at the regular time, one o'clock and uh, get this posted right after we record so everybody can go out and listen. So, okay, girl. Good day and enjoy your grandson again. Thank I you. Pictures. Yeah. Wonderful. All Take right. Bye-bye.